Tonight we welcome two native artists whose music blends hip hop poetry and spoken word to explore the legacy of broken treaties, colonialism, and native genocide in this country. Their work calls out historical wrongs while uplifting the courage and joy of indigenous youth. Frank Wallen attended Columbia College Chicago where he where he received a BA in Audio Arts and Acoustics. His awards include three Native American Music Awards, the National Center for American Indian Enterprise Development 2014 Native American 40 Under 40, the 2014 Chicago Mayor's Award for Civic Engagement, and the 2016 Three Arts Grant for Chicago Artists. He's been featured in BuzzFeed, Playboy, Vibe, NPR, ESPN, and MTV's Rebel Music Native America. Tanea Winder attended college at Stanford University where she earned a BA in English and the University of New Mexico where she received an MFA in creative writing. Since then she's co-founded As Us, a space for women of the world and founded Dream Warriors, an indigenous artist management company. She guest lectures, teaches creative writing workshops and speaks at high schools, universities and communities internationally. Welcome to you both. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. So, um, Mike Nunania Tnea Winder, Nunania Tmutwachich Mamach. I just introduced myself in the Ute language. I said, My name is Tnea Winder. My Indian name is Winterbird Woman. It means during the winter when all of the birds leave, that the Winterbird stays to continue bringing song and healing to the people. So, I'm just going to jump right in here so Frank and I can get started, and then there'll be time at the end for questions. So, I'm going to start with a song. I actually first wrote this one um, when a friend of mine was getting bullied by some people, and so I wanted to write a song to just express how I felt, but just the way that we bully a lot of our relatives, whether they're male, female, trans, or two-spirit, and so um, you'll notice that this song, I just use different um, pronouns to honor that, and it's called uh, He Was the Rain. <clears throat> He was born in the rain, grew up to become a storm. They asked for a sound to heal their pain clouds, rinse it away like he was, like he was, like he was, the rain. He was the rain, he was the rain, he was the rain. They called out her name, begged her for thunder and a flood. Everyone expects her to wash away all their fear and shame Like she was, like she was, like she was the rain She was the rain, she was the rain They begged them for flight and blamed them for every lightning strike. And they watched them falling as they were calling, Please hear my heart. In a world dead set on burning, how could they expect them to stay like he was, like she was, like they were the rain. Thank you. 
Next, I'm just going to um, jump into a poem that I wrote. Um, so this poem comes from my first book, which is called Words Like Love. It was published by West End Press in 2015. It's essentially my MFA dissertation turned into a poetry collection. Um, and as a writer, I've just struggled a lot with finding what my voice was at the beginning. Uh, you know, Stanford definitely placed on me an aesthetic. I read a lot of like Wallace Stevens and writers like that. And then when I went to UNM, it was a whole different aesthetic. And then I also took um, 12 credits at UC Boulder when I was working there and it had a whole another aesthetic as well. And so one place was more narrative poetry, one was more lyric poetry. And so I really struggled with trying to find my voice. And looking through that book, I can tell which ones I wrote at each institution. I can tell which are Stanford poems, which are UNM poems. Um, and the last poem in the book is a spoken word poem, which I think gets closer to who I am as an artist and what my voice is and what actually led me to start doing more songwriting. Um, I've only been playing for just a little over a year, but you know, my spirit is happiest when I'm singing and so um, I'm grateful just for poetry leading me there. So this poem is called, um, I actually wanted to call it if I could turn back time so I can make a funny share joke. But um, the first time I performed it was for these middle schoolers and they had no idea who Cher was. So um, I had dated myself, but I performed it and I said, what should I call it? And they said, you should call it Back to the Beginning. <clears throat> Sometimes I wish we could start back at the beginning, turn our existence into a videotape, call it life. Then push life into a VCR, press play and pause, get the chance to rewind where the image still on screen, watching everything that ever meant anything reverse with the push of a finger. If we could press rewind, the wrinkles on these God-given shells would smoothen into soft, unscathed skin. We'd awaken from tombs, arise from the earth like trees living to become seeds. And I guess that means as babies, we'd go back to our mother's wombs. If we could press rewind. Mothers or fathers who abandoned their sons or daughters wouldn't walk away, but return, run backwards, turning towards their children so they would never have to look into eyes that ever saw them as unworthy of keeping. History wouldn't repeat, but instead fold into itself like disease-ridden blankets, rolling themselves back up like yo-yos returning to the hands that ever made those hateful gestures in the first place. Battles wouldn't end in bloodshed, but instead a ride off into a sun rising with warriors always returning from war or boarding school with their hair flowing behind them in lengths of rivers. Rewinding would mean going back to school to unlearn all the lessons ever taught to us. We'd start books at their ending, unstring sentences into letters until all we were left with was sound, waiting to come out of our mouths. Like my friend Angel, his would open to fountain gallons of vodka from liver. His throat would spill it back into bottle after bottle after bottle that he'd set back onto the shelves of a liquor store he'd walk out of in a line so straight. It'd lead him to the day Angel's father cut off his wings when he left him fatherless, falling asleep on a bench, rewinding he'd unfreeze to death as warmth re-entered his body, convulsing not in dry heaving, but reheating, detoxing into calm as snowflakes slowly rise to the sky. Imagine the kind of miracle time travel like needles sucking poisonous drugs from addicted veins, pills and dissolving into wholeness, being pushed back into containers, fitting just right. Everything would be all right. And for our youth, who contemplated taking their own lives or committed suicide would feel blood flow back into open cuts, their veins pulsing with life that knows it's worth saving so much that determined hands repeatedly pull away razors from wrists, leaving behind no scar, no trace, not even the memory. And any fist that hits someone in rage or abuse would loosen into outstretched arms to call you home instead of the bullet-shaped holes making their way back into the guns or mouths that shot them in the first place. If we could rewind... Maybe I could remember if I ever said anything to hurt Angel. If we could rewind, my angel would be able to fly backwards, lift himself back up, and life would be breathed back into him as he unwrapped the rope from his neck to inhale sweet and ever-expanding air into his chest. If we could rewind, I could tell Angel over and over, I loved you, I loved you, and it would always, always start with you alive and well and not me. I'd gladly give up every poem I have ever spoken, have my mouth call back each and every one of them from your ears, back into my pen's failed attempts at trying to put back together the splintered pieces of our hearts, our hearts, our hearts staring at a blank page, wishing we could begin again. And so I'm very grateful um, 
for my friend and knowing him and just the impact, the endless impact that he's had on me and my life, especially my um, my artist self and, and me just wanting to work with Native youth. So my main job is I, I work full time for an Upward Bound program at a university in Boulder. Um, and I've been there about 10 years now and I've worked with so many Native kids throughout that time because for a grant we're supposed to track them for up to 10 years after they graduate. So literally hundreds of kids. Um, and I use the passion and love that I wish I had had for my friend to like let him know that it's never okay to take your life and that you're loved and people love you and I really believe in helping people heal through the power of love and I try to infuse anything I write whether it's poetry whether it's nonfiction, whether it's music into into that and so with my kids go with so much, you know, parents choosing alcohol or drugs over them, parents choosing partners over them, like boyfriends or girlfriends, and it really just hurts their spirit so much. You know, I see a lot of parents, like, struggle to want to give their kids everything, like, every kind of material thing, but really it's just showing up and, like, showing them they're seen and they're loved, um, and I have to deal with a lot of, like, intense things with my students, and so sometimes all you can do is just pray for them, and so I wrote this song for my students, I mean, for anybody who just needs, like, that uplifting and hope or prayer. Um, Frank's going to join me on bass, and this song is called Pray For You. He told me that he just wasn't enough The world told him as a man to be tough you got tears, son, you just bottle them up. up. Is this love? Is this love? She kept telling me how everything went wrong. She kept singing these sad, sad songs. Asked the sky to please open up. What's love? What's love? All I could do is pray. I pray, I pray, I pray for you. All I could do is pray. And I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you, I'll pray for you, I'll pray for you, I'll pray for you. When you're home and your heart are in a lot of pain, just can't see a way to survive another day wake up begging creator to take you away not today it's okay i pray for you and i don't know what else to do put the mat go down and i send my prayers Please send light to the ones I love. This is love. There is love. All I could do is pray. I pray, I pray, I pray for you. All I could do is pray. They asked for ears to listen to what they had to say. Just wanted a way to paralyze the pain. Creator, please hear the ones who cry out your name. They said their hearts were held by fear. 
How can you forgive who caused those tears? Can we please redo those tender years? All those years, all those tears. All I could do is pray. I pray, I pray, I pray for you. All I could do is pray, and I'll pray for you. Thank you. Shout out to my super supportive boyfriend over there. <laughs> He's all the woos. I love him a lot. Um, so I'm going to end with a song. So I've, I never can write happy things. I always really try. Um, but um, So I tried to write a happy one. And this is it. Um, <clears throat> You know, part of being an indigenous artist is a lot, it's interesting trying to like quote unquote make it, you know, because you balance like humility with accountability, especially if you come from like a really, like my reservation's really small. You know, if I post or tweet something, somebody's calling my mom and my mom's like, did you put this curse word on there? I raised you better than that. Um, so it's like, I'm always like put in check constantly. Um, and so one quick story I'll share just comes from my mom's reservation. And so it's a, it's a like generation story. It's from the Pyramid Lake Paiute Reservation. And on this reservation, they say that this lake was created by an original man and original woman. And they had four kids. Um, and the four kids, they got along when they were little, but when they got older, they were fighting. And the parents said, if you keep fighting and not getting along, I'm going to separate you. So of course they kept fighting. They weren't getting along. And so she separated them. They said, I'm going to send two of you to the north and two of you to the south. When you get there, make sure you light your fire so we know you're okay. And so days pass, days pass. They see the smoke from the south so they know those kids are okay, but they never see the smoke from the north. And so the mother cried so many tears, she created this entire um, lake made out of tears in the middle of the Nevada desert. And she turned to stone, so she sits there today waiting for her children to come back to her. And one of the meanings, one of the many meanings that comes from that story is just the importance of lighting your fire and that each of us has a fire in our hearts, a gift we're meant to share with our families, with ourselves, with the world. Um, and whatever your world is, it could just be your household. It could just be like you and your family, you and your loved one. But to make sure you light your fire during your time on this earth so your ancestors know you're okay. So this song comes from um, just kind of thinking about that stuff. It's called It's a Good Day. And it has the Ute phrase, it's a good day, um, and it says, tu te And so it's my first time incorporating language into a song, and Frank's also going to join me too. And we just practiced this this morning, so. Woke up this morning to greet the day, lit my sage to give thanks and began to pray. I asked creator, do what you can to guide my path. That's all I ask to it's a good, good day. Yahweh, to to Let me serve the ones who need to see what truths you've placed in my heart and song. Help me find the ones who teach lessons I need to carry on. To Tavea, it's a good Hey, 
ancestors, please protect my spirit. Those I hold dearest in my heart. If there are wounds, help me heal them. So others no love even for a minute. To Tavea, it's a good, good day. Yahweh, to Thank you. Um, thank you so much for listening and supporting. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, my brother, Frank. Give it up for Sanea one more time. Give it up for Sanea. Mitako yapi, oyate tchacha omani and macha pelo, naha iuha chante washte and nape chuza pelo. Hello, relatives. I just introduced myself in my language, uh, Lakota. I'm Sichongu Lakota. And I said, my Lakota name is Oyate Tchacha Obumani, which means walks with the young nation or walks with the new nation. And I also said, I walk, welcome you all with an, an open heart and an open handshake. And um, I also go by Frank Juan. And I'm, like I said, I'm Sichungu Lakota. And I come from a place in South Dakota called uh, the Rosebud Reservation, born and raised. And I was taught to uh, introduce myself in my language, everywhere I go by my elders, and that name was given to me actually by elders in my home community and ceremony. And um, you know, the fact that I, I like to open my, 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 my shows and my performances and my talks with my language um, is not a, 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 a light task And the fact that we, we're bringing language into this space because it actually used to be um, illegal for our ancestors to practice our cultures on this land, including our language. And actually our ancestors were really persecuted for speaking our language and suffered a lot of violence for speaking our language. And so <clears throat> this, uh, this kind of led me to a new phase um, as a songwriter and as a writer. You know, I, 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 I grew up not speaking my language and I didn't know that there were fluent speakers in my family until I was older. So when I was in my, my early 20s, my mom casually mentioned that her grandmother, my great-grandmother, um, was fluent in Lakota, but she never taught them anything or she never spoke it at home or never spoke it around the family. Um, in fact, she would only speak it when she would get around other um, grandmothers in my home community that they would have a, uh, a flea market on our res. And when they would get together, they would speak Lakota to each other. And my, um, my great-grandma Lulu actually took it to the grave. She took our language to the grave with her. She never passed it on in our family. And when I was in my early 20s and I learned that I wasn't yet really in a phase in my life where I was questioning why the way things are the way they are, you know. So much of my life was out of my control as a Native person. You know, you know even on a larger scale, our lives have been um, subject to U.S. policy, whether we like it or not. And so I used to not question things. And so... I didn't question why she never spoke it. And then I started learning about, um, uh, you know, our, our ceremony, our religions becoming illegal in 1884. From 1884 to 1978, the U.S. government <clears throat> outlawed all Native American religions in this country. And essentially, our religions were our cultures. It was the way we spoke, the way we danced, what we ate, what we, the songs we sang. They lumped that all under religion and made it illegal. And it remained illegal until 1978. Um, uh, the Indian Religious Freedom Act passed in 1978. So not only was it illegal for us to speak our language, you know, we would get arrested out in South Dakota um, they would have to do all this in secret and hiding. Um, also, they, they uh, started this program. The government started this program called the Indian Boarding School System. And it was started by this US general named General Pratt. And he lobbied to the US government. And he said, I got this plan to take um, Indian children and to educate them and assimilate them into becoming American. The, the, the phrase was to kill the Indian and save the man. 
Um, but uh, General Pratt's design was was military and militant, and he got the green light. So he started the, his first school in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. They gave him an old military barracks. So it was even like housed in a military barracks. And it was ran like a military death, death camp, um, these boarding schools. They, they shipped the children off. They took them by force, coercion. A lot of the parents didn't even really know what they were signing their kids up for because we didn't have things like boarding schools and take, removing children from community. We didn't have things like that. So a lot of parents didn't even know what they were giving their children to. And um, these, these kids went to boarding school, a whole generation of Native children, and um, they were abused for speaking their language, physically and spiritually and emotionally and um, sexually abused. And a lot of them died. A lot of the kids died. And a lot of the parents um, were very angry and hurt because, they, number one, a lot of them didn't know what they were sending their kids to. And then next thing you know, you know, they get a letter saying, five months ago, your child died at this boarding school. And so, um, you know, they, they cut their hair. They abused them for speaking their language. And so not only was it illegal under U.S. law for us to speak our languages, but you then had a whole generation of Native, um, Native people that were abused for speaking their language and watched their peers die for speaking their language. And these boarding school circumstances were so bad. We have a sister. Her name's um, Lila June. She's Dene. She's another artist we perform with. She's incredible. And she studied um, boarding schools for her, uh, her education. And she was telling me that she was reading um, how in, in a lot of these boarding schools, the children even starve themselves rather than um, stay alive. So they would give them food, but a lot of these kids would rather starve and die than be alive in those, that situation. And so I can't imagine what you'd have to do to a child to make them starve themselves to death. You know, let's just think about that. That's what happened to our grand grandparents and our great-grandparents and that's what happened to my great-grandmother and that's why she was ashamed of speaking her language and that's why she didn't teach it and that's why she stopped speaking it um, she stopped speaking it to survive and she didn't teach it to her family to survive and when, when I connected all those dots it really hurt and it felt like this big hole was was here like something big had been taken from me and I didn't know there was this huge gaping hole this whole time. And, um, <clears throat> you know, of course, you become very angry and frustrated when you learn about these things. And uh, like I said, it shifted um, my focus as a writer most recently. I decided to use my, my songwriting to try to learn my language and to try to learn Lakota because now there are resources. Um, you know, that there's, um, there, there's fluent speakers back home who have created resources and a dictionary and there's cultural, cultural revitalization programs now happening all throughout the U.S. Um, you know, because this didn't just happen to my people, this happened to over hundreds of different nations here in the United States. The United States um, holds over 500 different distinct indigenous nations. And after all was said and done, 99.8% of us died during that genocide um, out of the hundreds of millions of indigenous people that used to already live here and exist here. So, you know, the, um, that's the sort of uh, stories we hold in our DNA even if we don't know it as native people. And I didn't know it for the longest time because I didn't know this history. And my family didn't talk about these things. And I think a lot of our families never were given the privilege to talk about these things in Hill. And so, like I said, you know, I, 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 I was able to connect these dots of history to why my family, um, you know, struggled with things like addiction and different forms of violence, emotional violence and physical violence. And, um, you know, and I learned about this thing called historical trauma that Native people have. And Native people don't know what that means, but, you know, essentially it means that trauma can be, this idea that trauma can be passed down through DNA. And actually, settler science is catching up to that, even though we've been feeling it for hundreds of years. I recently remember reading a study was done where they took a generation of rats in this, this, um, this, 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 this experiment, and they would um, put the smell of strawberries in the, the pen with the rats, and then they would shock them. And they did this for a whole generation of rats. 
until it was ingrained into the rats' brain that when the smell of strawberries were coming, they were going to get hurt. And so then, then they took the, uh, the grandchildren of those rats, so two generations down the line, who'd never experienced that in their entire lives. And when they would put the smell of strawberries in the pen with the grandchildren of these rats, they would get agitated, they would get anxious, they'd get frustrated, they would, um, they would react like they were being shocked or about to be shocked. So that shows us that, that that trauma imprints on the DNA. And if that's what rats are holding with being shocked, you can imagine what people who survived genocide are carrying in our DNA, especially when 99.8% of our people were, you know, essentially killed. And so, um, you know, I think one thing we try to do as artists is to not only talk about that, but to use our art to work through that and heal that. Because... You know, I was taught as a Lakota person, time was fluid for my people. And when you tell stories and write songs and sing songs, you can time travel. And so I really believe, you know, through art and through healing ourselves, we can heal our ancestors. And we could heal some of those wounds that our ancestors took to the grave, even some of our grandparents, even some of the wounds that our parents have. And so that led me to this song that I'm about to do. I wanted to write a song in Lakota. And, you know, we aren't, aren't able to, like, plug in and do a full concert with a sound system. So we're giving you guys the acapella acoustic version. So I'll do a flute and acapella version of this song. But uh, this song is called Wana We Chichaga. And this is a Lakota phrase. And this is a phrase that was actually taught to me about two years ago by a Dakota man. So within, um, you know, the, 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 I call it, kind of think Game of Thrones dynasty of, of, of the Ocheti Shakoi, so the people of the plains. There were three different bands. There was Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota. And then even within those bands, there were other bands. So Lakota people had seven bands. So Lakota, Nakota, and Dakota, our languages are similar, but also different. So I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. So thank you for Lakota people is Wopi La. Lakota, Wopi La. Thank you for Dakota people is Wopi Da which is, you know, da, Dakota. So, like, you, you, you see that how our languages are different but similar. So when I see, see my Dakota friends, always, any Dakota people in here? No? Okay. I always make the joke, um, you know, instead of I love you, I dove you. I dove you. <laughs> because it, they have Ds instead of Ls. So um, uh, this Dakota guy gave me this phrase, wana we chichaga. And I was having dinner with him. I was doing some um, performances on the Crow Creek Reservation. And I'm friends with his nephew, who's also a native music artist. And they invited me and my mother over for dinner. We were having dinner, and he said, um, I want to teach you guys this old phrase our people used to say. We used to say this a lot to each other. You know, but it got lost during you know, everything that happened to us. And it's wana we chichaga. So wana means now, and we chichaga means we thrive or we prosper. <clears throat> And he said, I want you guys to uh, say that, you know, um, you guys are artists, so put it in your art, you travel around, you see a lot of people, say this to the people you love, say this to the people you care about. It's important that we start filling our hearts and our minds and our bodies with our languages again and all those things that they took from us, the things that made us strong and the things that told us who we were as a people. And so I took that phrase and just decided to write a song called Wana We Chichaga, but um, I'm going to do an a cappella version, but I like to do like a call and response. So do you guys want to um, wa learn one word in Lakota tonight? Okay, cool. So the word is uh, our word for nation or people, and it's oyate. Oyate. So we, could we say that? Oyate. Oyate. Okay, a little louder. Oyate. Oyate. Perfect. So in, in this song, like I said, I'll do a cappella, but, but when I put this hand up, I need you guys to say Oyate, and we're going to do the chorus together, okay? So do you remember what I said, Wana we chichaga means? We thrive or we prosper. So you're going to say Oyate, and then I'm going to say Wana we chichaga. So we'll be talking to each other, but talking about each other, and saying people or nation. It means all of us. Oyate means all of us. Now we thrive, now we prosper. So when I put this hand up, I need you guys to say what? Okay, we'll practice Oyate. 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 Okay, the, cool. Your cadence is good. Your pronunciation is good. You guys sound like Lakotas, but but the energy is low. The energy is low. The energy is low. We're about at a three or four. I know we're in a writer's museum. You're supposed to almost like a library. You gotta be quiet, but but we can we can get it a little louder. So let, let's try it a little louder. Oyate. Oyate. 
All right, cool. There we go. So whenever I put my hand up and I'll let you you guys know, we'll, we'll do that song together. So another um, thing I do besides play the bass, uh, I, I, play, I play a few instruments. Music was always an escape for me, a safe space for me, um, you know, as was reading and writing. But music was my language. So I'm going to play native flute during this piece as well. Naki wo glake e hanta tanya, a na kop tanyo, a na kop tanyo. Pretaki, kini yage, o ichi yapo, o ichi yapo. Ninaki wo glake e hanta tanya, a na kop tanyo, a na kop tanyo. Pretaki, kini yage, o ichi yapo, o ichi yapo. Now, just like we practice, you remember the word? So when I put my hand up, we'll say the chorus together. I need you to say it four times through. Oyate, okay? One, two, three, four. Oyate. One na we chichaga, one na we chichaga. Give it to me one more time. Oyate. One na we chichaga, one na we chichaga. Two more times. Oyate. One na we chichaga, one na we chichaga. One more time. One now we chichaga, one now we chichaga, one now we chichaga. So when I wrote that song, you notice that song wasn't very long and, and it had some repetition in it. And that was just an acapella version, like I said. But when I wrote that song, I didn't want to write a song in Western form, you know. And I went to school at Columbia and I grew up writing and speaking English and, and been studying music and how it's made since I can remember. And so, but, you know, it was a Western form. Um, and especially in hip hop, it's very kind of clear cut. You have a 16 bar verse, eight bar hook, you know, a four bar bridge, whatever. But, but things are very um, structured in a certain way. And I wanted to write that song how my ancestors wrote songs. So I was looking at some of our old ceremony songs, you know, songs that survived genocide. And I was looking at the translations of those songs. And I realized, number one, and as you might have heard, Lakota is such a poetic language, like it's so poetic and already flows. And so a lot of our songs were um, really beautifully written short snippets of poetry with repetition and sung or, you know, repeated with repetition. And so I wanted to write a song in, in that sort of way. And so um, that led me to Wana We Chichaga. And I want to thank you all for um, learning, learning that word in Lakota and saying that with me because... You know, like I said, my, my great-grandmother used to not be able to speak her language, and she took it to the grave. And, um, you know, Tanea and myself, a lot of Native people I know were very spiritual people, and I believe the spirits of my ancestors are traveling with me everywhere I go, and that includes my great-grandmother. And, you know, back home, they tell us that the spirits speak Lakota, so their spirits heard you guys speak in Lakota. They heard a room full of non-Native people speaking their language when it used to be illegal for them to speak it. So I want to thank you all for, you know, doing that little call and response and, 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 and you know, listening to that story. That's going to lead me into this next uh, song I want to do for you all. So, like I said, you know, I started out with a song about my grandmother, my great-grandmother, 
and I am the product of, of strong Lakota women. Um, I was raised by a single mom, and uh, I, I'm going to do a bass cover of a song that I wrote for my mom <clears throat> as a birthday present, actually. So this was when I was going to school in Colombia, actually. So it was this, this idea came to me not too far from where we're at right now. And I was, I was in school, and I was uh, on scholarship. So believe it or not, you know, I used to not believe in myself and my music for the longest, for most of my life. And, you know, when you grow up in a country that's built on not only the genocide and dehumanization of your people, but then you grow up in the aftermath of that. You grow up um, people that are really hurt, you know, and hurt people hurt people. So for a lot of those reasons, I didn't believe in myself or my music. Um, and my mom always believed in me, even when I didn't believe in myself. And she made all the sacrifices for me to be here. So I was in college on scholarship. I, was a, I wasn't getting booked to perform yet. I was a struggling student, starving artist. And I come from one of the poorest reservations in the whole country, so I was like three ways broke. And I, I, I didn't have any money for my mom's birthday. And she doesn't like parties, you know, and so I couldn't buy her a gift. And I was thinking, what am I going to do for my mom for her birthday? So I decided to use my gift of writing and songwriting to write her a gift or create her a gift. And so I wrote her this song. And like I said, you know, my mom raised me by herself. My dad was a really violent guy. My mom and dad split up when I was three. And uh, he's from my res, but he kind of abandoned <clears throat> me and her after that. And then <clears throat> we moved in with my mom's side of the family, which is um, a bunch of strong native women. They're known as the Wan girls, and they run a ranch on my reservation. And so me and all my cousins grew up together. My mom has seven sisters and three brothers, and, and they all had kids. And so my cousins were like my brothers and sisters, you know. And we, we were all being raised by our, our single moms. And so I, I always laugh and tell people we were kind of like the no dad tribe, you know, we were out there and um, our moms were raising us. And so I didn't realize just how unique of an environment it was being raised where, like, you know, there was literally like no male figures around except me and my little cousins growing up. And looking back, you know, I, I, I'm grateful for it because Lakota people, we used to be a matriarchal people pre-colonization and colonization brought things with it like patriarchy and extreme violence against indigenous women. And um, you know now we see an epidemic of missing and murdered indigenous women. And I witnessed that violence against native women in my own life and you know witnessed our own people enact that too. And so my, my mom is a really strong woman and, and she's been through a lot. So I wanted to create a gift for her, like I said, so I wrote her this song. This is called My Stone. This is a, a bass cover. And I'm going to um, position the mic out a little bit, and I'll just project it for you guys. <clears throat> Eighty-nine, we say hello. He says goodbye. Daddy left when I was three and made us cry. You and I, Clyde and Bonnie of modern day drama came and friends left, but Mama stayed through everything, all the fights and all the pain, all the change. I hate my dad, don't want his name. Told my mom that I'm a one, didn't understand all the things going on between her and my fam. But I was stubborn. I know that I make it hard. You always. <laughs> Said, son, I know you're gonna make it far. Believe that I need that in dark times. I think of what you did for me, and my heart shines. You took my hand up this mountain, made it your climb. So when I shine, mom, you shine. Yeah, a single mother with the odds stacked. You did your best. <clears throat> One day I'll bring it all back. Lives all my life, just me and you. Times got tough, and you see me through. I ain't have a dad, we ain't have a plan Raised by a woman, you made me a man I know I ain't home and your boy is grown I need you to know that you're not alone I can let it rock, but you will be my stone Forever in my heart, forever in my heart 
You always gave me what I needed, somehow always found the time Single parent, it's apparent that you stayed up on your grind I remember you would put me first It was hard, but you said, son, it could be worse And you were right, it's funny, looking back, days were sunny You kept me smiling even though we didn't have the money That other people did, somehow you made it happen I promised mom that I'm gonna do it when I'm rapping Cause you took me everywhere in my cap and my backpack Twenty years later, now I'm rapping and snapbacks I'm rocking the long braid, we came a long way You kept me on the right road, away from the wrong way Forever I'm grateful for the life you gave The tears that we cried, the sacrifice you made Yeah, a single mother with the odds stacked You did your best, one day I'll bring it all back Lived all my life, just me and you Times got tough and you see me through I ain't have a dad and we ain't have a plan Raised by a woman, you made me a man I know I ain't home and your boy's grown I need you to know that you're not alone I can let it rock, but you will be my stone Forever in my heart, forever you're my heart, you're my stone Give it up for Tanea Winder for helping me out on that I forgot to introduce her <clears throat> So, um, thank you, Tania, once again. That was uh, my stone. That was a song that I wrote for my mom, and that was a little bass cover. And, um, you know, like I said, uh, I wanted to write that for my mom as a, as a birthday present. You know, I couldn't create her a gift, so I wrote her a gift. And, um, you know, I've always used my music to, to as you've seen, kind of, kind of help me heal. And, you know, I was telling Tania, um earlier today, it's pretty cool that as two writers, you know, from reservations, rural poor reservations, single mother homes, um, who never set out to be writers, honestly, and poetry led the way for both of us. We both started out as poets, and we started writing poetry to process the world and kind of as an act of survival um, when our backs were against the wall and we were growing up in the aftermath of genocide and facing things like depression and historical trauma and PTSD and suicide, um, poetry and expressing ourselves through those words was helped us get through that. And that led us to, to being writers now, you know, and Tanea um, went and studied writing and she's published books now. And I've, I, I got my degree in audio arts and acoustics from Columbia. And so I never, you know, set out to be a writer, but I always knew that I was a writer in a way. And I felt that anything I wrote come, came from the common voice, whether it was on the bass or I was rapping in English or Lakota or now playing flute. It all comes from the same voice. So um, that'll kind of lead me to this last piece I want to do with you all. And this, this is a new piece that I'm working on, and it's not recorded. And this is only the second time I've ever performed it. So um, recently I started playing native flute. And... Um, uh, it's opened up a lot of doors for me, even creatively. You know, actually, I just want to share something real quick. Um, they haven't announced it yet, but I can announce it here. So have you all heard of this place called the Field Museum? Field Museum? So, so the Field Museum um, is redesigning their native hall. They took it down, and they're redesigning it coming out in 2021. And they got this really awesome person on their staff. She's a native and Korean woman from Chicago, born and raised. She's an artist. Her name's Deborah Yepa Papan. Um, she wanted to come here tonight, but she couldn't, so shout out to her. She's like an auntie to me. She's like an auntie to Tanea, actually. Um, she helped me out a lot when I moved out here. And she's now the community engagement coordinator at the field. And she's been doing a really awesome job of getting Native artists in to visit the collections at the field because they only show about 98% of what they have. And everything that they have from Native people pretty much was taken, you know, during that genocide. And now they're starting to recognize that. And th there are museums now in this country that are starting to recognize that a lot of their stuff that they have um, to display about Native culture it was right wrongfully taken and wrongfully displayed a lot of the time. And so they're trying to reconcile that in different ways. Some different places in the field is one of those places. So I, I got to visit collections, and in there I saw a drawer. I pulled it out, and um, there was flutes from like the 1800s, cedar flutes, flutes like how um, we don't even make anymore, flutes my ancestors made and played. And I kept thinking, I kept having this idea it would be so cool to make music with those flutes one day, um, even if it was just sampling them, you know. And so I kept um, 
I, I just kept saying I, I visited collections a couple times, I think three times, and I was like, I would love to make music with these one day. And so um, my auntie Deb, she heard the idea and she started, um, you know, kind of sharing that idea and it made its way to the team who's curating the new Native Hall. There's a, three curators. And um, actually some of them are fans of mine. I, a year and a half ago, I got to speak at the... Um, at a museum at a museum conference, the American Alliance of Museums conference in Phoenix, Arizona, me and this black poet got to speak about kind of what I just shared about you, that colonial history that museums rightfully have a part of and what are they doing to reconcile that? What are they doing to heal those relationships and establish a connection with the communities that, that, that they are tied to through their artifacts? And so um, the, the, I, I, got to, I went and I met in with the team. It was about a year-long process. I literally um, you know, just secured it about a week ago. But um, the, the, the new Native Hall will have three spaces. And one of the spaces will be called I Create, and it will be themed I Create. And they will highlight and show the work of three Native artists working with items and collections to bring them to life. And I'm one of the three artists they're going to work with. I'm going to work with their flutes to do music for the new Native space in the Field Museum. And I just signed that contract last week. So, um, you know, the, the flute is leading me to some uh, really interesting, interesting, um, some interesting endeavors. So this last piece I'm going to do is a flute piece. And this is a, um, a new piece I'm writing. And uh, this, this piece is called Woa uh, Kintunze, which is the Lakota word um, for forgiveness. And I wrote this song um, uh, for my family, I think, in a lot of ways. Because, you know, I shared with you all some of the colonial violence that resulted in the reality of Native peoples. You know, we survived a genocide. 98% of us were slaughtered. Um, a lot of reservations were actually just concentration camps, death camps, where they marched us to die after they, they tried to slaughter us. And so, you know, there was just a lot of violence that was inflicted upon my people. And because of that, we're really hurt. And there's a lot of violence in our communities because of that, you know, a lot of lateral violence. Even within my family, I shared with you all, I come from a, 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 a family that's at times violent. And a lot of my personal traumas that I'm healing from came from my family members, you know. And um, it hurts, but I understand where it comes from at the same time. You know, and I talked about um, violence against women, Native women particularly, and we still see that today. And, and even in my own family, in my life, you know, like I witnessed um, one of my cousins tried to shoot my mom in front of me, you know, over, over some BS. So this violence against Native women not only happens without our community, but within. And I think um, that's something that we need to work on as Native people, particularly Native men. And um, so, you know, I've been working through that and music has been leading the way. But, you know, I've been thinking the more I'm learning about my language, how I feel is English can't really express how I feel sometimes, you know? And I think people who speak multiple language, languages can relate to that. But I, I only grew up speaking English. Um, they took my language from me. <clears throat> I speak my colonizer's language. And so sometimes I can't express myself how I want to through written words, through even speaking. You know, so as Native people living in a country that was built on our genocide where it used to be illegal for us to speak, how do we keep that oral tradition going? How do we express ourselves when sometimes we don't even have the language? And I think for me, this flute is one of those ways as a Lakota person. You know, I was taught that um, this flute came to my people to express love songs. And that was kind of how um, we started out on this was writing love songs. And that got me thinking about what do love songs look in a time of genocide? You know, because love for us has changed and sometimes that love is painful. And sometimes that love is forgiving the family members that hurt you, you know, forgiving my mother for the times that I shared with you that song I wrote for her, but, you know, our relationship was not perfect, and it's not perfect, and it never was perfect, but we're working on it. And there were times where I really felt like she abandoned me, you know, and like Tanea shared with you all, she sees it with the kids she worked with, and, you know, I, I, there were times where I felt like my mother abandoned me for, for men, for people she loved but maybe couldn't be with, you know, um, freely. And there were a lot of times where I was left alone and, a lot, and I just had music. And so I decided to write this song to forgive my mother. It's called Wo King Tuze. But 
the more I play it and the more I, I, I realize that it's probably for my family too, to forgive my family. And, um, you know, I, I think that, that that's one of the biggest tasks we have as Native people because, like I said, we come from a hurt people who hurt people. And forgiving the people uh, who love you, who you hurt, is a hard task. But I think that's something that we need to do. And we're here because of love. We've survived genocide because of love. So I'm trying to cling to that love to get us through the, the aftermath of that genocide. This is Wawa King Tunze. So uh, that's all we got for you guys. Thank you very much. I'm Frank Juan. Give it up for Tanea Winder one more time. Thank you to the American Writers Museum for bringing us out. <laughs> <laughs>